Welcome to the latest posting in the video blog of St. Nicholas Orthodox Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Last week, we looked at the story of Cain and Abel, which takes up a better part of chapter 4 of the book of Genesis. Chapter 4 concludes with Cain becoming estranged from his family and wandering off to live in the land of Nod. And that's what the word Nod means, by the way. It means wandering. So he goes off to live in the land of Nod and uh, to establish a family there and his descendants there who are also, as we look at the story, estranged from God. Uh, chapter 4 concludes with the, uh, the account of Adam and Eve having another son, uh, Shem. Chapter 5 then is an outline of the, of the genealogy of Adam from Shem and through Shem leading all the way up to Noah. Now, here we figure probably we're on familiar ground. We know the story of Noah, uh, but do we really know the story of Noah? Noah is a very important person in the Old Testament. If you look at Adam and Eve, our first parents, they get chapters 1, 2, and 3 uh, of the book of Genesis. Noah gets chapters 6, 7, 8, 9, and technically 10, because 10 talks about the genealogy of Noah. So he gets all this space, he gets five chapters, whereas Adam and Eve, our first parents, only get three. Now what we know about Noah probably comes from some children's Bible stories book, a compilation of, of stories written for kids that was either read to us when we were children or that we read to children ourselves. Uh, we don't really perhaps know the story of Noah as we should. Noah's an important person because he is one of the very first direct types for Christ in the Old Testament. Now we said earlier on that as we read the Old Testament, it is full of typology. Typology are these, these markers or this foreshadowing of people and events in the Old Testament specifically pointing to Christ and the church. And so Noah is one of the very first types, he's the very first clear type uh, of Christ in the Old Testament. And there are a number of things that we look at the story we can see parallels. We're going to look at five ways that Noah is a type of Christ. First of all is his name. The name Noah means rest or comfort. Noah's father Lamech named his son Noah saying, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. So life has become much harder for the human race because of sin, and Noah will be the one to bring rest from this struggle. Similarly, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And in Hebrews chapter 4, we read that there remains a rest for the people of God. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Christ brings the ultimate rest from the toils and struggles of sin through his death and resurrection. Next, both Noah and Jesus bring with them the hope of new life. Through Noah, the world has the hope of rebuilding after the flood. And through Christ, we have the hope of the new heaven and the new earth in God's kingdom. And in both cases, this hope is a hope for all creation. Genesis 8.1, we read that God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. All of them are delivered from the flood. And similarly in Romans 8.21, the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So through our salvation, all of creation is saved. Next, we have the importance of water. In the case of Noah, through water the world is cleansed of human sinfulness. In the case of Christ, through the water of baptism, we are healed from the infection of sin, from the consequence of sin, and from the tyranny of death. And finally, we have covenants. Through Noah, God establishes his first covenant with humanity. Genesis 9:11, God says, I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And then through Christ, God establishes his final covenant with humanity. Hebrews 9.15 reads that Christ is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So this new covenant is the covenant of Jesus' broken body and shed blood for the remission of our sins and for the life of the world 
and for its salvation. On my office wall, I have a plaque. From the very first landing on the moon, Neil Armstrong and his quote, that's one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. As a kid, I just loved the this, this space travel and, and, and all that was around it and watched very, uh, very intently the, the, the coverage of the moonshots. And I bought books about, about spacecrafts and travel. And one of the things that I learned in those books is the idea of trajectory. And trajectory was that if you want to get to the moon, you don't aim for the moon, but you aim for the position where the moon is going to be when your spacecraft gets that far. So uh, there's all these calculations that are done to, to figure all of that out. And this is the trajectory that the, the craft has to be on in order to get to its destination. Well, you see, the Bible also has a trajectory. The trajectory of the Bible is Christ. And, and the church, his gospel, and, and the good news that is proclaimed through the church. That's the trajectory. And so all of the Old Testament takes us on that trajectory. And all the typology in the Old Testament is part of that trajectory that points us towards Christ and his church. That's very important because the Bible is not just a random collection of stories about God, particularly the Old Testament that it actually takes us somewhere. But the problem is because we have the impression from those children's Bible stories about, about God uh, that, that it's just a collection kind of like Aesop's fables or something, we miss the patterns and we miss that trajectory. To understand that though requires a more mature understanding of the faith. Sunday we're going to talk about this a little more. Sunday is also the Sunday of the prodigal son. The story of the young man who squanders his father's inheritance on wild living and finally comes to himself after living in a pig pen in squalor. And when he comes home, his father receives him with great rejoicing. There's a certain maturity that we need to be able to accept that it's time to come home. And so we'll talk about that on Sunday. Our, our faith has to be childlike in its love and trust, but it cannot be a childish faith. It has to be a mature faith that helps us to, to make sense of the world around us and our experiences and carries us back home to God. So that's what we'll look at on Sunday. For now, though, and for always, to God be all glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, both now and forever and unto ages of ages. Amen. We'll see you in church.